Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to Science Faction. The only show where a scientist, a comedian, and a comedian scientist come together to discuss science. Comedically. Hello, and welcome to Science Faction 46, the science faction of Palladium. Ooh, I know. Yeah. It's also, by the way, the number of human chromosomes that each one of us has. 23 sure, yeah, 23 from, from, each. from each parent. And it's the molar mass of ethanol, which is probably the most important thing about being a human. Yeah, so it's how much ethanol you drink. It'll get you drunk. <laughs> I am your host, comedian scientist Robert Timothy. With me, as always, our biomedical research scientist, Jackie. Jackie, how are you doing tonight? I'm good. I'm getting geared up for a big trip. She's the, got a bunch of acid factory. lying around. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. exactly what I meant. And stockpile it. Yeah. And speaking of her acid dealer himself, Mr. Damien Mercado, our comedian. How are you doing, Damien? I'm doing great. I think it's time to kick some names and take some ass. I I think that's right for you. <laughs> <laughs> and we, of course, are here at the Madhouse Comedy Club along the downtown skyline in beautiful San Diego. Come on out. Check out the Madhouse Comedy Club's San Diego's Funniest Person Contest if you get a chance. Damien has yet to uh, go to his first night, so he has yet to be kicked out of it. But that's coming soon, so you should be happy about that. Funny. They're just going to give me an automatic pass to the last round. I have to imagine after oh, the first like a round. handicap. Oh, you're going to skip all the interim rounds. You're going to have <laughs> such a good intro set. Well, I think they're going to be like, listen, there are going to be a lot of comics we can't out of this competition, yeah. you know, who go up against them. I mean, let's create some drama. Truth be told, if I were running best, I'd have Jean-Claude Van Damme just fight the last guy. Just have him be in the last round of everything. Don't have him waste time making his way through the prelims. For any of you who wonder how Damien can kind of make himself successful as a comedian, you know, given his clear inability to make funny jokes, <laughs> let's just say, bringing up what Jackie was talking about earlier, nobody ever kicked radio off the football team. That's all I'm saying. That's true. <laughs> but anything, they kick the ass of people who make fun of radio. That's so. right. Oh, it sounds like we're going down. <laughs> <laughs> well, before we go down, we better get into these science articles. From molecules to particles, this is Science Articles. Okay, now can I go down <laughs> on yeah. science articles? <laughs> Article number one, seal the deal. Guys, this touches on one of this show's favorite topics, which is interspecies rape. Yes! Oh. thought you were going to say seal the artist. Seal the artist <laughs> raped a penguin. No, um, so we she, talked she doesn't look like a penguin. I mean, she has gotten better looking. In she looks year. like a rose on the grave. <laughs> more, <laughs> more like an albino gazelle. So we've talked before about chimps sexually assaulting frogs to death. Mm -hmm. The same is true of river otters and baby seal pups. I like that one. A brand new example of interspecies sexual predators. Fur seals in the Antarctic are raping and killing penguins as we speak. Bum, bum. That's the law and order noise, you know. From when... So these <laughs> seals, <stabler> down there. <laughs> these seals, which usually hunt and eat the penguins, have recently been found catching, pinning, and sexually assaulting them. Wait, so pinning, they wrestle, and then once he gets them down for three yeah. seconds, it's... it's pretty much that. Yeah, this is especially disturbing. Only you don't get to tap out. <laughs> This is especially disturbing because birds don't have vaginas. They have what's called a cloaca, which is just kind of like one hole where everything slowly falls out of, and the male has... You're you telling know, me like, vagina's not a hole? Yeah. Come on! A male can kind of rub his cloaca against a female and get some sperm in there, but it's no not the sex like we mammals know it. Right. Nothing about what you said sounds unattractive. Start that. <laughs> well, maybe not unattractive, <laughs> but think about the pocket of a pool table. Mm. Of like a very shallow pool table, yeah. it ends there, right? Yeah. Us mammals, we're used to having no end in that. We're used to a basketball hoop. That ball can keep cycling through and cycling through. Mm. Vaginas at infinity. One of the disturbing part of this is sometimes they see the penguins walking away bleeding out of their cloaca, which means that their cloaca has been ruptured and a hole has been pierced into their body. Rape isn't pretty, boys. I that's always all, thought it was, but learned. clearly not. No, I'm here to tell you. This is not your grandmother's flower-filled romantic <laughs> rape. Hell no. My grandmother's cloaca <laughs> was ruptured eight waves from Sunday, and she told me how horrible sex can be. I know exactly what you're talking about. So this behavior was first observed in Ot 6, which, by the way, I'm psyched that we can start using now. Ot 6. Yeah, in Ot 6, but has since been observed with greater frequency, leaving some researchers to believe it may actually be a culturally transmitted phenomenon. They are learning rape. Well, I mean, they're watching. I, I personally watched the video. How are they yes, not watching? Yes, I have watched it. I mean, I've watched it a few cut. times in slow mo. Exactly. In all but one of these cases, the seal has let the penguin go after the act. Though in the most recent one, it did consume and eat the seal after it raped it. Which, by the junior high homophobic logic we all grow up on, means that because he did indeed eat some semen, which was his own, uh -huh. Super he's gay. 
totally gay. Super gay. Yeah. yeah. A couple of questions, guys. This is a very interesting story, very arousing story. I'm aroused. A couple of questions. Question number one. If this is culturally transmitted, who taught the first seal to rape a penguin? Was there just one mentally unstable seal that started a horrible societal trend? What's going on, guys? Uh, it was Bill Cosby. <laughs> Cosby <laughs> on the Antarctic tour back in the mid '80s. Uh, yeah. Did he always I mean, used to? Everything's call- coming out of the woodwork now with Cosby. That's there how was it a period in the mid '80s when a lot of comedians were booking Antarctic tours <laughs> just because pictures of the place made it look like it was covered in cocaine. <laughs> Nailed it. A group of fur seals who saw Cosby. He referred to penguins as pudding pops as a joke. They didn't mm-hmm. understand it. And from then on, they've just been <laughs> raping pudding pops. Uh, you guys can check the video of this out online. I would say it's disturbing. Not that disturbing. Kind of funny. Um, yeah. On to question number two. Should scientists begin assassinating rapist seals? If it is cultural, is it our moral obligation to prevent such a sexual assault from occurring right in front of us the same way we would with human beings? Is Do it- we let the penguins get raped? See, the, you, this is how we got into Iraq. We're going to get into yeah. a long, protracted war. And you don't feel to... that it's our place as the yeah. U.S. to involve ourselves in foreign policy exactly. between SEALs and penguins. We got enough going on. Listen, the SEAL nation is strong. Can our military walk through them? Yes. But we're going to have to hold them. I mean, let's just say, as a guy who served, I would hate to have to yeah. served in the Arctic Ocean. I mean, that's a horrible duty station. Yeah. Plus, it's only a matter of time before a penguin that traveled to Liberia will come home, infect everybody with Ebola. Okay. And then we don't have to worry about it. So you think all the penguins will die from an African disease. Okay. Right. Yeah, fair enough. Because of all the brown first seals. <laughs> <laughs> Question number three. The elephant in the room is that humans do this interspecies sex too, usually to elephants in this very room. <laughs> we don't know if it was... I don't like my new nickname, guys. <laughs> <laughs> we don't know if it was forced or voluntary, but we know in ancient times they boned Neanderthals. And in modern times, one needs only to go no further than your computer screen to see humans copulating with a wide range of different species. Sure. Your computer screen, yeah. more yeah. specifically, Bobby. Listen, any, oh, it's everybody. anybody's <laughs> computer screen can see it. Yes, mine has uh-huh. much more. Yeah. Is consensual interspecies sex a bad thing? I want to know how you're sure it's consensual. Okay, what about this? I'd spent a lot of time growing up listening to radio shows, looking up crazy shit online. A lot of these (laughs) stories, women, I think sometimes men too, will allow a dog, a male dog, to have sex with them. Now, the dog is choosing to. It's coming up and mounting them. That seems to be pretty consensual, right? We're not talking I, peanut butter tricks. We're talking the dog yeah. is mounted. Yes. Yeah, no. In cat style or something. But By the way, pe- peanut butter on your balls in the dog world is like like date rape. It's like drugging the dog. It's essentially dog <laughs> roofies. <laughs> if human females couldn't say no to roofies, yeah. yes. Like, a, like if, I were to, if a human female were to watch me put a roofie in a drink and then be like, oh, you son of a bitch, you know I That's can't how it say works. no to that. That's exactly how it works. <laughs> That's why every once in a while, if I'm at a dog park, I'll just have a, a jar of peanut butter. I slip into the water bowls of some other dogs. Jesus. <laughs> Get them for the taste. I want God. you to walk into a dog park and just start slowly while staring at the other owners, slathering <laughs> yourself in peanut butter. Rubbing it down. Essentially. <laughs> Getting all the dogs Shaking worked up. Shaking your hair back. Can I just say this is like the second time in as many weeks that we've discovered a system in which sexual attraction is governed by a human being smothering peanut butter on their bodies? <laughs> First being, of course, the famous peanut butter brides, the dowry. Yeah, right. <laughs> this is a proud right. tradition of peanut butter brides. <laughs> so, Jackie, is is consensual interspecies sex bad? I still don't. I still. Is I don't that think not why it's it, been made for? What about what why about wouldn't that be consensual? Human males, yeah, raping. Okay, but I'm saying I'm saying consensual. Say the consensual ones where the dog is nailing the chick, right? Is that? I first of all. <laughs> Not exactly what I call a typical consensual sexual encounter. Yeah, but, you're right. Okay. You have a probably, yes on both sides. <laughs> probably a, as little as one out of three sexual encounters involve that situation. But are, so are we sure the dog wanted to fuck her? You were doing everything. Well, why else would he do it? I mean, he could go sniff himself elsewhere. I think you have all, you men, you disgusting vermin men, yeah. have all had sex with things you didn't want to. But we still chose to. That's still <laughs> consensual. Yeah. Unless right. what you're saying is us sleeping with women is not consensual, in which case having sex with another woman wouldn't be cheating. It would just be doing what we do unconsensually. Right. Just be raped. Maybe this will help get an answer out of you. And uh-huh. help. Right, um, you saw The Little Mermaid as a little girl, right? Yes. Okay. Did you want Prince Eric and The Little Mermaid to be together? No. You did not. Okay. Well, then she's completely against interspecies <laughs> erotica. And heartless. <laughs> All right. On to article number two. Synesthesia. Synesthesia me. Synesthesia is how, a f- how would I even synesthesia you? Well, you're about to hear. Is it consensual step, synesthesia? Yeah. You? By both tasting and feeling his genitals in your mouth at the same time, <laughs> you have synesthesized him. I wouldn't say it's consensual, but I'll do it if you got enough peanut butter. Um, <laughs> synesthesia is a phenomenon in which senses overlap, so they taste sound or associate certain words with certain colors. 
It occurs naturally in as many as one out of every 23 people on Earth and is interesting not just as a novelty, but because historically, many geniuses report this characteristic and its usefulness understanding complex math in their heads or writing symphonies by seeing the colors. We know a lot of geniuses have reported this phenomenon and have commented on how it's really useful in them being able to do the amazing things that they can do. Damien, as our resident genius, do you feel like you have some synesthesia? Yes, I can smell all the jokes in the air right now. Oh, okay. Which is why they're so funny. And they're, but if you don't hear, if you're not laughing while listening to this, it's because they're scent-related jokes. Like, That's right. Like, this Got is a it. very poor medium for me to be giving these jokes to you. We do a lot of odor humor. Oh, okay. A group in England sought to study if this phenomenon is a genetic trait or a learned one. Researchers at the University of Sussex used a tiny study, a sample of only 14, and they put them through a nine-week course and they were able to develop varying degrees of synesthesia, every one of them. They basically taught them how to do this. Now, this doesn't mean they're a natural synesthetic. They're not this type of person who was born with it. In fact, they found that this effect fades after about three months if it's, the courses aren't kept up with. So this is a temporary version of it, but it is attainable, I, I mean, seemingly by most, if not all people. What's really interesting is that group, on average, their IQ raised 12 points over a control group which is incredibly significant. 12 points, so average is 100. If yeah. you were, your average person went from 100 to 112, it's not like you're going to be in genius level or anything. But that's super significant, and it fits with a lot of what people tell us, that it helps you do math processing if you could imagine colors that go along with numbers or shapes or sounds. Mm -hmm. It helps you process that data much more completely. Are you saying that like with this program, a young Forrest Gump's mom wouldn't have had to make some unsavory decisions with the principal but to get she her son sure does care about his schooling boy she would have had to do the same thing to the synesthesia group they're pretty horny dudes <laughs> <laughs> this may indicate that these abilities are in reach for all of us especially children who might be able to adapt this as a lifelong learning tool the synesthesia effects wore off after about three months like we said we don't know about that iq because they didn't retest them but this could be the next version of those brain training games and it might actually be quite effective a couple of questions from my panel Question number one, what would be the most surprising thing about experiencing synesthesia? Uh, the insults I get for sounding like a fucking idiot. <laughs> Why would you sound like an idiot? <laughs> this red tastes sour. I, I mean, like, I can't even process how this even happens. <laughs> She's a genius. Shh, don't say anything. <laughs> well, that, uh, you actually bring up a good point. So imagine that how this would happen to you as a firsthand experience for those who have never experienced synesthesia yeah. before. Imagine hearing or tasting a color. Yeah. So you might see blue. And mm -hmm. you might get a taste in your mouth the same as if you tasted, I don't know, strawberries. Just something, some random connection. Uh -huh. You might have that cross link. So you're getting a visual stimulus, but receiving the input from your brain as if you were getting an actual stimulus on your tongue and tasting it. So it's, it's almost kind of like a mix-up of those wiring. But that mix-up helps you deal with things a lot better, especially numbers. A lot of the people I've met who are very high-level math geniuses, you know, the guys who were doing calculus when we were in mm -hmm. middle school, those type of people. The ones who never had sex. Yes, all of those guys. Okay, got it. They all described to me a method that they do math when I would always be like, how could you do it this quickly? Like, you know, I remember physics yeah. homework taking me two hours, and it would take somebody who had these math abilities 20 minutes because they could breeze through the math like it was nothing. Mm -hmm. And they could do it all in their head. And when I asked how... They would explain similar things. I can see the colors of numbers. So if I know four, it's this light red. When I see four, it comes out as that light red, and I have a feeling that goes along with that. That helps me negotiate what that four is, where I place it in the mathematical equation, how I keep track of it in my head, so that I can do these big, complex problems without mixing up numbers. To you, they're all black. You're just looking at one thing. Excuse me, to me, they're all white. <laughs> What if he was colorblind? Do you think? Oh, like, like, that would be interesting. Yeah. What Synesthesia with colorblindness. Yeah. I, I don't get it. He's supposed to be a genius, but all of his math problems are wrong. It just <laughs> in a very predictable manner, every way. What do you? Yeah. Guys... Wait, yeah. Well, let's talk about that. Like, what if everybody interpreted, you know, that was that is synesthetic, interpreted a different color with a different they do. taste. So then, how do you sort of? Because group it, things correctly. I guess what the, the issue isn't necessarily that your synesthesia needs to match up to Damien's synesthesia. The issue is that when you view things like numbers, or in the case of people who do music, sound, and mm -hmm. things like that, if you can see sound, if you can see the way that D-sharp looks, and you can feel and experience an emotion in a way that a crescendo is supposed to go. Mm -hmm. If you can do all of this, you have another barometer by which to utilize that information. So if I'm thinking in my head, what's 
127 times 355. I can use those numbers and use the mathematical processes in my head to go through it. But if instead each one of those numbers have a specific meaning to me, a color, a feeling, an emotion, a taste, I can manage those numbers much easier in my head. I have two reference points now. I don't have to remember, was that 167 or 178? I could be like, no, it's, it's a hot dog, blueberry, kitchen table. All right, I know what that number is, you know? So back onto that, what was the most surprising thing about experiencing synesthesia? The most surprising thing would be with all the combinations of senses that I can have, mm-hmm. how much better I am than Helen Keller. And yet people won't remember <laughs> sure. my name. You are, you do have much more sensory input than Helen Keller. Sure. Uh, and oddly, much less successful. Question number two, inducing different thinking and learning states is an interesting approach to education. What new approach will take the education world by storm? Well, I'd say your answer from a bit ago, your uh, hand jobs for good grades. Oh, this was oh, a plan yeah, that I came yeah. up with a long time ago. You take the hottest girl who's not going to college or not doing anything in the senior year of a high school. When she graduates, she gets a job working at the library, which is now doesn't have any books in it. There's just a bunch of cubicles because everything's on iPad. Uh-huh. So she goes to the library, gets in a cubicle. Every student who gets an A in that high school that she went to gets to then come to the library, exchange each of those A's for a hand job from the girl who was the hottest chick in his high school the year before – Boom, grades go through the roof. We blow the Chinese out of the water when it comes to STEM education. All of a sudden, everybody's super educated millionaires. Society's problems are gone. I remember the only one who was against this was Jackie, who hates education. Whatever. I believe if if I heard what you said right, why should they get to learn... When I don't want them to. That's not, no. And then also, I think you followed it up with, I think that would empower women too much. They might be able to get a head on their shoulders, and I'm tired of those skinny bitches telling me what's going on. Okay. Okay. I, you know, I'm not even going to dignify this with a response. You've just been hateful. Sit quietly and just hate fuck you both in my mind. (laughs) (laughs) Woo, we're getting laid. (laughs) We must have gotten A's. (laughs) <laughs> All right, let's move right on to Tell Me a Story. Tell me a science story. They're like children's stories, only with less sex and more science. Very interesting Tell Me a Story. We actually had this slated for a few weeks ago. It kept getting bumped because of time restrictions, but this is one we just had to come back to. It was too interesting not to. It's called Crazy Is As Cat Does. We've talked a few times about a parasite in cats called toxoplasmosis, which is really, really interesting. It's known to hijack a rodent's brain and alter its fear responses so as to not be afraid of cats. So then that rodent gets eaten by a cat, and the parasite gets to breed in the cat's stomach where it likes to be. So this is its plan. It's going to live in a cat's stomach. In order to get into another cat's stomach, it's going to get pooped out, get inside of a mouse brain, fuck up the mouse brain, get that mouse to get eaten so it gets inside of another cat. Devilish. It's brilliant. It's brilliant. (laughs) It's so simple. We talked about how it actually infects humans, and most people don't even know they have it. It affects one out of five Americans, but some countries have well over 60% of their populace infected. But it can mess you up if you're pregnant or have a bad immune system from HIV, that's one of the reasons doctors tell pregnant women to stay away from litter People boxes. with HIV. Or stop yeah. <laughs> My doctor is a strict no-glory-hole policy. Listen. <laughs> when no. you're pregnant. <laughs> We've also talked about how some data suggests it alters behavior in humans as well, making them less responsive to fear and more likely to take dangerous chances, including a couple studies that show an increase in motorcycle death crashes with people who have just gotten infected with toxo. But new research out of the University of Pennsylvania hints that this parasite might also be responsible for up to one-fifth of all diagnosis of schizophrenia in the U.S. Jackie, that's fucking crazy. That's crazy. That is One fifth is an incredible amount. We've talked before about how schizophrenia, recently deemed to be eight yeah. separate diseases all working in concert uh, that we call schizophrenia, is the leading cause of homelessness in the United States. It's a debilitating, lifelong disease, one that's very hard to get over, and one of the most difficult mental health diseases to treat. So yeah. one fifth of all of those could be from fucking cats, Jackie. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I say stop fucking cats. I mean, I've been saying that for years. Yeah. But... <laughs> Your whole anti interspecies rape just yeah. coming back again. Yeah, I mean, it, this is what this is where that leads. Is okay, she, consensual. I don't think so. She's into this though, not for any altruistic reason, because she'll still have the dog clean her body with peanut butter. No, she's just in it because cats have rough tongues and it hurts her. Yeah. <laughs> so, guys, uh, a no long, pussy on my pussy. <laughs> a long association has been noted between toxo infections in humans and schizophrenia, including the fact that countries with higher toxo rates also have higher rates of schizophrenia. So a group sought to calculate the PAF, or the Population Attribution Fraction, which is basically the amount of that group that has that thing because of a certain fact. In other words, how many people have schizophrenia because of toxoplasmosis? 
So they compare a bunch of different numbers to do that. This isn't a exact science. It's very broad, and there can be a lot of errors. It's in sexist. This. But because it's it, not exact, it's a female science. That's it's right. a broad science. I didn't, that's that's <laughs> fucking. How do you even work Thank in you, this Damien. field? Finally, <laughs> I didn't say I was a hysterical, shitty driver, Damien. Come on. Oh, um, that's funny. That's good. Yeah, good joke. Good joke you had there. Yeah, there's a lot of humor and honesty. And I appreciate that, Bobby. <laughs> so he got around twenty one point four percent, or one in five. So now it could be that Toxo can aggravate a pre-existing condition in some people who were predisposed for it, but might otherwise not have actually gotten it. It could be that Toxo can cause a particular brain disorder that mimics the symptoms of genetic condition like schizophrenia. It could also be non-causational correlation. Like schizophrenic people are more likely to come in contact with cat feces. Mm-hmm. You mean where, like crazy cat ladies? Where most of the infections occur. <laughs> Which I think, by the way, I think that's a safe assumption. I think if you were to be I, like, absolutely. I'm going to propose that schizophrenics may get at least 1.5 as much cat feces as your average person, I think you <laughs> could totally, say like, yes. Totally valid. It could also just be that his numbers were off, but regardless, we should study this closely because if one-fifth of all the homeless people in the world are out there because of fucking cats i'm finally calling for that motherfucking cat ban yes down with cats what do we do if we confirm that a disease that approximately one-fifth of our population already has might increase the likelihood of them developing one of the most life-altering debilitating mental diseases how do we begin to address a whole nation filled with toxoplasmosis one-fifth of all our people have it if we find out that that causes schizophrenia what do we do with that one-fifth of all people between a recent study using cameras on cats collars showing that suburban cats commit an ecological genocide on the area surrounding their homes, the possibility that the parasites might be causing one-fifth of most of our serious mental health problems, and their fucked-up attitude, (laughs) when does society close the YouTube window and say, fuck cats? God, we gotta get on that. To me, there are two possible candidates for even the possibility of the highly anticipated zombie apocalypse. One is rabies, (laughs) and the second is a parasitic organism like Toxo. Toxo is kind of a zombie-like disease in rodents. What if it evolved to affect humans in a similar fashion, but along with disabling their fear, it disabled their empathy and moral right and wrong, and we were attacked not by a zombie army of mindless dead flesh, but cunning and conniving, ruthless, sociopathic killers intent on your destruction. I'm imagining being hunted by a bunch of cat ladies, and I think I got this. Like, I don't... I, I, <laughs> yeah, I, I, no, how cunning are we talking about? <laughs> no, it would be every... Think of it. You know, one-fifth of the population gets it, then they're going to spread it with their crazy toxo cat bites as they're going around trying to bite people, and you're just going to get your crazy toxo disease and want to murder people. But if, there's a, if they're as competent as a crazy cat lady... Then I'm good. Now, don't get me wrong. If there's as frustrating to talk to as a cat lady, then I'm doomed. Because like, if the whole world it was just filled with crazy cat ladies, and I had to deal with that for conversation oh, for the rest Jesus. of my life, I just nope. kill myself or get bit. Now, yeah. will will Real the quick. toxo zombie apocalypse happen? With almost 100 percent certainty, no. Oh. Should we stockpile ammunition, water, and canned goods for the possibility of occurring? Fuck yes. Yeah. <laughs> Let's move right on to I call BS. I call. I call. I call. I call. I call. Ring, ring. I call BS. All right, guys. Are you guys ready for next version of the game that's sweeping the nation by sweeping storm? Sweeping the nation. Mm. I've gotten more comments in the last two weeks about this one section we've done than any of the other ones. Everybody seems to love this. Play along at home. This is called I Call BS. It's where I present four different science articles to my panel. They decide which ones are true, which ones are BS, of course, standing for bad science. And... <laughs> Then they get points scored accordingly. I- to be fair, though, we invented this game so I could show that anybody can do science and that, well, Jackie can't. Oh, okay. Oh. Okay, so the score is five to seven. Surprisingly, Jackie's believe. behind, and I must to say, let him believe. you have to look back at the episodes because Jackie actually managed to, to get the answer wrong while getting <laughs> the answer right. Yeah. So it was really impressive. Thank and Damien you. managed to get the answer right while having no idea what the answer was. <laughs> yeah, the difference between men and women right there, right? Scoreboard. <laughs> All right, guys, we got four, Shut up. we've got four articles. Are you guys ready for them? <laughs> Let's do this. Article number one. The largest ever prehistoric landslide has been discovered in Utah, spanning more than 1,300 square miles. Article number two. Research from Japan suggests an aspirin a day does not lessen the risk of dying from a heart attack or stroke in those who have never had either. Article number three. Fool's gold may not be foolish at all, as it may replace silicon in our solar panels. Article number four. A bus powered solely on human feces is now ferrying people around the UK. All right, panelists, let's start over with number one. The largest ever prehistoric landslide has been discovered in Utah, spanning more than 1,300 square miles. Jackie, is this true? 
I do think there is a lot of territory in Utah that we don't know anything about. Now I'm all jaded from last week, and I want to say this is true, but it was like Nevada, mm-hmm. you know? Okay. So I'm going to say yes. Jackie it's says true. Jackie says true. Damien, what do you think? I'm going to say true as well, but I think you clearly read this in the Book of Mormon. This was Moses parting the seas. It all happened in the United States. It's all right oh, there. Okay. Oh, this was, was a landslide that happened? Got it. Okay. I always thought Red Sea meant the Red Sea, but you yeah, think instead it means a non-existent body of water in the middle of... Utah, Utah 20 million years ago. Run by communists ago. Okay. Yeah. years ago. Yes. Okay. Well, at least it makes sense. Uh-huh. Number two, research from Japan suggests an aspirin a day does not lessen the risk of dying from heart attack or stroke in those who have not had either. Jackie, you're the medical expert. What do you think? I think this is true, but part of me is thinking it's true because in Japan, heart attacks are not as prevalent. Yeah, because, because they're of the tiny diet. and they, have good, they eat good food. <laughs> yeah. yeah. They exercise. So, so I could see a population in Japan you know, not necessarily benefiting from an aspirin a day. Mm-hmm. Um, I do believe I've also heard that aspirin is not advised to people in certain age groups, particularly young age groups, and mm-hmm. that it's not actually beneficial. So I'm going to say that this is good science. So this is true. Damien? I'm going to say it's false because, yeah. I agree. In Japan, not much difference. All right, but we need blood thinners here to keep from stroking and heart attacking out because we have so much blood thickeners in our food. So it has to be true. By the way, Wait, that's not false. it's not in everybody's food. That's just that gross thing you do to people's food you don't like when you put their blood thickener in it. All right, on to article number three. <laughs> you said false and then ended with true. I'm going true. You did say false. Right. Did okay. are you changing it to true? Uh, it's true. It's okay. true. So now you said true. You can't have more than one answer, Damien. That's rude. I'm not Bobby. I'm That's my story. rude. Yeah, yeah, Damien, you're being inappropriate. <laughs> Article number three: Fool's gold may not be foolish at all, as it may replace silicon in our solar panels. Jackie, is this true? False. All right. Any reason or just random guess? Totally random guess. Hey, you gotta love that, Damien. <laughs> I'm gonna say true. And not that it matters, but the way you tell the difference, if you bite your solar panel and if you see <laughs> yeah. marks in it. Then it's, that is silicon. If you don't, it's fool's gold. <laughs> gotcha. Got it. Got right on. And probably one of the most interesting ones, number four, a bus powered solely by human feces is now ferrying people around the UK. <laughs> yeah, I think this is false only because I'm not sure why you would need to limit it to human feces, uh-huh. particularly. So you're because... angry because there's not enough animal feces involved. Well, in this. I just think it just seems a little strict. As a member of the animal feces lobby, you think your <laughs> constituents are being ignored in all of this. I ju- it just seems like you know all this cat shit with the uh-huh. toxo. We could put uh-huh. that to good use finally. Finally, big animal feces is showing its ugly head by sponsoring Jackie. Stop raping us and just use our poo. <laughs> Worst thing to hear on your wedding day. Go ahead, Damien. I want to say I heard something about this, but I'm going to go false simply because they couldn't figure out a clever enough name for the bus. Like Jack the Ripper, Jack the Shitter. They just, okay. There was just nothing there. Okay. Bad, bad bus naming. All Expect right, guys. from the British. We have our answers in. I hope you wrote your answers down at home. Come along with us. See who won. On to article number one, the largest ever prehistoric landslide has been discovered in Utah, spanning more than 1,300 square miles. Jackie thought this was true. So did Damien. This one is bad science. Ah. Fine, we're even. Yeah, at least we both got it wrong. Uh, a large landslide spanning 1,300 square miles called the Market Gunt was recently discovered, making it, of course, the second largest landslide oh, after the Hart Mountain Slide, which happened bitch. 50 million years ago in Wyoming, and I think that's pretty common knowledge. So <laughs> I want to recount. Yeah. Recount. <laughs> Article number two, research from Japan suggests an aspirin a day does not lessen the risk of dying from a heart attack or stroke in those who have never had either. Jackie thought this was true, and so did Damien, despite the fact that he originally said it was false. <laughs> Thank you. And the answer is... Science! Yay! It also apparently fails to protect against non-fatal strokes and increases intracranial bleeding. People on low doses have fewer non-fatal heart attacks, which is a good thing, and fewer mini-strokes, which is also a good thing, than non-users. But researchers looking at the data actually felt it inappropriate to continue administering aspirin, and the study was stopped five years into the six-and-a-half-year study. So they actually felt it was doing enough damage to benefit ratio that it was unethical to continue giving wow. aspirin yeah. to people, which, by the way, these guys should talk to the Tuskegee guys. <laughs> they should get together a little, 
He's like, we don't think it's so great to keep giving these people aspirin. They're like, we let people die of syphilis for 40 <laughs> fucking years, you bitches. Science up. Man up, Jap- Japanese. <laughs> Very interesting stuff about aspirin. I, I actually think you're right. I think that the general health and genetic predisposition of the Japanese community means that that may not apply to Yeah, us. perhaps not the best. Might, might not work group. for the big boys, you know what I mean? <laughs> Uh, on to article number three. Fool's gold may not be foolish at all, as it may replace silicon in our solar panels. Jackie said false. Damien said true. This one was science. Oh, Ooh. damn it. Iron pyrite has the properties of a photovoltaic. We've always known that. But tests have not been able to produce the Stop needed dancing. voltage. It's got all the requirements for it except voltage itself. Researchers finally found out why it doesn't create voltage <laughs> I wish the listeners had synesthesia and could hear the victory dance yeah. that Damien is doing right now. Victory up. So researchers <laughs> finally found out why they couldn't get any voltage out of iron pyrite, and it turns out that the crystal structure of iron pyrite is missing a sulfur atom in some of these crystals, and that is keeping the voltage from basically going through, even in the most perfect crystals. Now that we know this, we need to find a way to fix it, and we can start looking to silicon alternatives. Should be pretty cool. And the last one, a bus-powered solely by human feces, is now ferrying people around the UK. Jackie says false. Damien also says false. This one is bad science. Yay! Though there is a bus running on some human poo in the UK, (laughs) it is actually run on biomethane gas, which comes from microbes digesting a mixture of human waste and rotting food waste. So technically it does run on some human waste, but uh, if you research biogas, you find out that most of it is probably food waste, mm-hmm. um, and some is some is human waste. The reason I think this is uh, so neat is because this is actually an attainable do-it-yourself home energy system that is really easy to do. It's used a lot now in third world countries, but it could where it be, already smells like shit. Yeah, but it could be here in the U.S. or other first world countries too. This is a really easy process that you can actually create energy in your own backyard. All you need is a tank and some table scraps, and you can produce a methane gas similar to the natural gas that you use to heat your stove. Additionally, since the methane is not escaping from a landfill unburned, you're also lowering your carbon footprint significantly because methane's really bad for the environment. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like home mulching, only if mulch could cook your food and power your lights. Basically, what you do with these systems is think of a tank that is made of like two drinking cups with the top drinking cup being bigger than the bottom one, and it overlays it almost like you would if you were mixing a drink, you know? So that is essentially an airtight tank system that can fall all the way to the ground where it's very small, or it can rise up with that top cup rising up and get very high. And that's what happens when it fills with gas. You load the bottom with that mulchy stuff. There's a bunch of bacteria in there that just naturally eat it up, put out methane. As they put out methane, that top part begins to rise and rise as the gases inside accumulate. And by the end of the day, that thing is filled up. It's filled with gas. You put a heavy weight on top of it. You have a valve. It pushes that top part down and pushes gas out. You can cook on it just like you could turning on a stove. You can hook it up to a stove. You can hook it up to a generator. You can use it for burning. You can use it for all that stuff. So it's very cool, very attainable. I think you're going to be seeing a lot more of this in places like America and first world countries. It's already been used in third world countries. And it's really kind of neat. I mean, Mm. mulching is stupid. And this is cool. So Is this where you're going to finally get that pipe you were talking about for pooing just oh the poo shoot the poo shoot pipe. right yeah. onto the apparatus like, for and those then... of you who don't remember the poo shoot was my idea to eliminate toilet paper from the world it was a pipe that stuck out of your toilet that you inserted into your rectum then pooped uh, and then pulled out and then no poo ever touches the outside of your body your body is completely clean yeah i think you need like a sheath or something that way if you didn't yeah. lose your footing and just become impaled you need <laughs> yeah but i'm just saying this goes on the outside of this apparatus and now why does damien keep trying to lose his footing <laughs> <laughs> Goodbye, cruel world. All right, let's move right on. Finish my story. Finish my story, where one of us has to complete the other's balls. All right, for those of you who don't know, finish my story is when our research scientist, Jackie, gives us the beginning of a recent scientific article, and myself and Damien compete to try and finish it. Damien, are you ready to play? Let's do it. Let's go. All right, gentlemen. So listeners at home probably don't know exactly what you look like. But I'm letting them know today there are two handsome gentlemen sitting here with me. Imagine two gods, just two yeah. beautiful specimens of human meat. Yeah. That or the two old dudes heckling yeah. in the Muppets. Like <laughs> the it's two like old a mixture. That's a little bit closer. <laughs> like yeah, if, they if have you Muppet mixed, skin. I should have said that. If you mix two of the buffest dudes from the movie 300 with those old Muppet dudes, <laughs> that's what you would get. <laughs> no. We do hate Persians. <laughs> True story. Keep going. So, two handsome gentlemen 
with sort of more unique eye colors. Uh, Bobby has some some gentle sea blue eyes. I have very light blue eyes. Yeah, very light blue eyes. And then uh, and Damien has sort of a a combination, like a hazel green blue. He insists they change colors um, They're depending mood on eyes. the drug. Oh, yeah. <laughs> But they're sort of a greenish color. <laughs> Curious, do you guys think eye color influences any aspect of your life? What What do you think eye color says about you? That I'll never have to sit on the back of the bus. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they're light blue is what I'm saying. <laughs> also that I could have been in Village of the Damned. I mean, they're really... Yeah, they're really light. Yeah. Like, like they're creepy. You, if you were to say you're lightly blind... Yeah, like somebody might like. Yeah. Oh, get, totally. Yeah, oh yeah, you could get away with that. Find a way to glass your eyes over a little bit, just to... though. It also means that Hitler would have wanted good things for me. <laughs> I mean, just in general, you know, he'd want me to be successful. I wish no ill will. Yeah, upon. he would hope that I had won the Olympics against a larger, more athletic black man. <laughs> as long as he wasn't Jewish, to yeah. be fair. Right. Yeah. Also, I do like to rely on my eyes to tell the rest of the world that, despite my skin color, I am not actually an albino. <laughs> Thank These God. are not pink. Thank that means God. I'm a regular. Yeah. <laughs> Damien, what about you? Yeah, what, what do you think your eye color says about you? Well, if it wasn't for my skin color, uh, my eye color is really the only thing letting somebody know that my last name is a typo. Like Mercado <laughs> really throws people off the trail. Yeah. yeah. Now, do I get, is that my one answer? Do I get like three more or. You know, or, like, what's well, funny, are, are you sort of painted yourself into a hole because I, I was just casually listening yeah. and going along, and then you stopped <laughs> yeah. what you were saying you to kept, announce that you were done. You could have tried to do one of your sneaky, gross, try and put two answers in there thing, but you I drew attention noticed. to yourself. Yeah, yeah, I did you draw attention to myself. Foot. This is a podcast. We're all drawing it. I'm not at home ma- quietly masturbating to some German dungeon porn. I am here broadcasting to the world. <laughs> Loudly masturbating <laughs> to some German dungeon porn. <laughs> With headphones on. <laughs> Now I can hit the table. So, 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 all right. So my answer's done. All right. Yeah, your answer. Answer. yeah, you ended that for yourself. Yeah. So now I'm going to tell you the real answer, which is that eye color might say something about your pain tolerance. Ooh. Yeah. Th- so this was a study in actually Caucasian women, and they found that light colored eyes. The most pain tolerant is people. On the <laughs> hold on. Hold on. <laughs> They're pregnant. Let's oh. get to that part. <laughs> Caucasian women with light colored eyes, blue or green, appear to tolerate pain better than Caucasian women with brown or hazel eyes. So in this study, they had 58 pregnant women, 24 uh-huh. with dark colored eyes and 34 with light colored eyes. You're going to need a bigger sample than that to make such a crazy claim. I agree. Those with the lighter eyes achieved greater reductions in postpartum anxiety, mm-hmm. depression, and catastrophizing and rumination, which says the study, which was done at the University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine. So this is just a pilot study. Yeah. As Bobby pointed out, it's a very, very small sample group. But the increased pain reduction was also observed when they were given epidural analgesia. So the dark-eyed women had greater pain, experienced about a 60% reduction in pain at mm-hmm. rest compared with a 45% reduction in pain at rest among the women with light-colored eyes. So the women who got the epidural with dark eyes thought there was a bigger reduction in pain than the women with light eyes, suggesting that the women with the lighter eyes could tolerate the pain better because they both got the same epidural. Were they able to find a way to control for cultural differences? I mean, you could imagine that maybe all these light-eyed people came from Scandinavian parents who were like, you don't cry. Right, yeah. So it, it, all, all that it gives us for the population was that they were pregnant, Caucasian, and from the greater mm-hmm. Pittsburgh area. So okay. I'm not sure on their actual upbringing. How'd I don't know how many were brought up in dungeons versus pillow talk or whatever. <laughs> how'd the Steelers do that year? Because yeah. that's that, <laughs> like this from Pittsburgh. Those people bleed gold and black. Yes, well... Fair enough. The figures in pain reduction after the epidural show a trend, but they are not actually statistically significant. Okay. So it was just sort of an interesting observation. But you know, eye, eye color is an interesting thing. The first blue-eyed person, the mutation that made blue eyes in human beings, only arose less than 10,000 years ago in one person and has then spread to everybody who has blue so eyes. So maybe they're like fresh, they're just not as jaded. <laughs> well, here's something else interesting. It came into existence in Northern Europe, as far as we can tell, it seems to have. There's also an interesting thing that just, you know, as we start learning about individual genetics and population genetics, one of those weird things is that Scandinavians, those from those people from those northern European latitudes, have a very high natural immunity to HIV. Up to 12% hmm. of that population is completely immune to HIV. You could inject it in their blood, nothing's going to happen. Oh. So Where else could I inject it? <laughs> no, not because they're hardy, <laughs> but because they were genetically isolated for long enough to have a different set of population genetics. Now, this isn't eugenic stuff. They still have a lot of problems. Yeah. Fucking take them into the Caribbean, see them get sunburned, see how great their <laughs> genetics do them then. But it would be interesting to think that there could be an issue of 
blue eyes not necessarily causing something, but being an indicator of coming from a certain population of people that had these other characteristics. Yeah, so that's basically what the conclusion of the study was. It's not that your eye color actually dictates whether or not you can tolerate pain. Mm -hmm. It's the idea is that there must be or could be some sort of genetic link between the gene that codes for eye color and its proximity to a gene associated with pain tolerance. The researchers for the pilot study sought to have a homogenous population as possible. That's why they picked pregnant women, which I thought was an interesting thing, is because Caucasian pregnant woman was a way to make all of the people in the study sort of be in the same spot in life. Also the worst Indian name ever. (laughs) Caucasian pregnant woman. So I just thought that was an interesting way of doing that because all of the women were at the same part of their pregnancy and so they were sort of believed to be in the same sort of tolerance, intolerance point in their life. But basically the research in pain phenotypes and more readily identifiable features like eye color could enhance clinical care and treatment effectiveness, which influence patients' physical and psychosocial well-being. So they're thinking that knowing this about a person could then influence how you treat them. So. It's just a pilot study. It's it's kind of interesting. It's obviously correlative, yeah. but very very interesting stuff. Who do you think took that one, Jackie? Keep in mind, you did cut off my answer. So. Oh, oh, that would be Bobby. Yeah, it turns <laughs> out I could be Damien's half an answer. I did not cut you off. You cut yeah. yourself off. So I got my no no no. This because is your there's punishment. Two separate rules this that I can have. Punishment. Let Damien you self circumcise. Let's move on from that and just push on. Hope you guys enjoyed this episode of Science Faction. Come on back next week for a very special Thanksgiving Science Faction, Ooh. Science Faction 47. And until then, keep looking at the stars. These synesthesia classes are really working. I can hear this penguin's cloaca. You've been listening to Science Faction. Wait, that's not right. Stop raping us and just use our poo.